imagine me, I'm coming from my nonprofit world thinking all people want to do is help people. And then I get sat into this with a supervisor who was completely unsupportive. And I learned so much from her in a different way. Like I learned so much about how to be assertive, how to stand sure in my purpose, what's important to me and where my limits lie and where I'm not willing to budge. So I am grateful for that. I just also was a very tough pill to swallow how far different companies are willing to go with making money at the expense of someone's mental health. And I find that disgusting. Welcome to The Unknown Options, the place where we explore The Unknown Options, the number one source for career apprehension and accessibility. My name is Will, and today I'm with me, Erica. Erica, it's great to have you here. Give us a rundown on who you are and what you do. Yeah, my name is Erica Curry. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, and I work with elite athletes. Thank you for coming on today. Your journey is important, so we want to highlight the good, the bad, and the ugly. For someone who might not know, what is a licensed marriage and family therapist? Mm. A licensed marriage and family therapist is a licensed therapist. And contrary to popular belief, the name would suggest that we work with couples and families. I do not do either of those things. I only work with individuals. And like I mentioned, I work with athletes. Uh, the good would be I enjoy talking with people. So if you enjoy talking with people, that is the good thing about being a therapist. Um, the bad is how long it takes to become a licensed therapist. I had no idea. Um, the ugly would be the things you can encounter on your journey to becoming a licensed therapist. There's a couple of roadblocks on, on the way of, of getting here. Okay. I love, it. We'll, we'll dive deep into all those things. Tell us your journey on how you became a therapist and, mm -hmm. and, and, and pick that niche that, uh, with athletes too. Yeah. So how I chose to become a therapist was uh, a lot in part due to what I saw all my teammates doing. I was a division one springboard diver at Wagner College. It's a tiny private school in Staten Island. And all of my teammates were doing amazing things after college. We have a lawyer, a couple of registered nurses, physician assistants, someone who works in Homeland Security, a PhD in biology, just absolutely unreal women. And I was like, all right, if they can do it. I can do something too. What do I want to do? And I really appreciate psychology. I'm very interested in human behavior. And I noticed that mental health was something that was put very much so on the back burner for especially athletes and male athletes, but athletes overall, really like having emotions in general is weakness. You need to tough it out through everything. And after sustaining, uh, I sustained a, an injury my freshman year of college. I broke both my hands on the diving board oh, during uh, my conference championship meet. We were in first, I was seated first, and this happened literally in finals. And I realized that I was more embarrassed than I was in physical pain, and it hurt really bad. So... To be more embarrassed than I was in pain was huge. Like, yeah. oh, that's something that I definitely should look into. And yeah. that was not anything that got tended to. Like, it was just, okay, let's rehab you. Make sure you go to the doctors, wear your cast, go ahead and support your teammates by sitting in on practices, even though you can't be there. But it was like, who was taking care of my brain? Who was taking care of the mental side of all of this? So that was what really got my wheels turning towards being a therapist and especially helping the athletic community because it's something that's overlooked. And we all know the saying that the game is 80% mental, 20% physical. So Definitely. we really do need to be paying attention to these things. That way we're not festering in these heavy emotions that create these roadblocks from performing our best. So that's really what got me to decide like, hey, I want to become a therapist. My teammates inspired me by everything that they were doing and I, just myself reflecting on my own struggles going through a sport and knowing that I could have used the mental health support. Definitely. I love it. That's, that's, that's an interesting story. Do you think if you wouldn't have had like the pain of you broken, breaking both hands that you still would have ended in the same field or would you have... Uh... <laughs> That's a really good question. Well, yeah, I definitely still would have ended up here because even before that, so 
when I started my whole life, I've been a jock. Like, honestly, like that's just me through and through. I have the ego of a jock too. I'm really still working on it to this day. Uh, but I, before I was a diver, I actually was a gymnast and like gymnasts are badass. Like that talk about mental toughness and pushing through anything. Well, by the time I hit 12 years old, I actually broke my elbow and I broke it so bad that it was a career ending injury. The doctors mm -hmm. were like, there's no shot. You're going back to gymnastics. I told them "Bet, watch me. No, yeah. I, hurt, I hurt myself again. So yeah. <laughs> it really was over. And again, it just kind of, even that, when I look back on it, I'm like, no, I, I needed the help mentally as well. Like I was holding on to a dream so tight because I didn't know what else to do. I, mm -hmm. if I don't, if I didn't have a sport, I didn't have a sense of identity yeah. and that's not true either. And that's why mental health, I think I would have always ended up here. There was going to be something, some reason that was going to pull me back to the core of how I see my journey through athletics and how it could have been enhanced that much yeah. more. Uh -huh. I, I love, I love what you said there. Like if you didn't like it, you had a thought of, if you didn't play sports, you wouldn't have an identity. And I think that ties right into the next kind of question. Like, what do you think like your niche of therapy, like brings to like society or to athletes, I should say. My niche of therapy, what it brings to athletes, I can tell you specifically, it brings mindfulness, distress, tolerance, emotion, regulation, and interpersonal effectiveness. Mindfulness is literally a set of skills that I teach that enhances and creates a sense of self, which can bring with it a sense of security that you do know who you are. You are not your sport. You are much more than that. Uh, emotion regulation. How do you gain control of your emotions rather, rather than your emotions controlling you? Distress tolerance is literally how do I get through a difficult situation like breaking both of your hands without making it worse? Because yeah. guess what? I made it worse. I finished that meet. I broke both my hands and I kept going. Zero oh, to man. 10 recommend. Yeah. Uh huh. I'm telling you the ego on me, the ego. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And then lastly, interpersonal effectiveness is communication skills. You got to be able to effectively communicate with your coaches and your teammates if you're going to reach that shared goal, whatever it is, whether it's a championship or Super Bowl, it doesn't really matter, whatever that goal is at the end of the season. Definitely. I love it. Okay. So, I mean, obviously you, you mentioned you're licensed. Uh, tell us like the process of is college required to do what you do? Like what's the licensing uh, process, all that? I, there's so much to it. I'm going to share what I wish I knew because I knew nothing. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> so yeah. yes, you got to go to college. Contrary to popular belief, you do not need to have a bachelor's in psychology that will help you out if you want to go get a, cause you have to get a master's degree in mm -hmm. order to then go become a licensed therapist. So having a bachelor's in psychology is helpful, not necessary. I had people in my graduate program who literally majored in like finance. And this was like a third career for them because also mm -hmm. becoming a therapist is typically not a first career choice for people. It was for me. I was the youngest person in my cohort. I was 22 at the time. And mm -hmm. most people, I want to say it was like, they were like between our range was 22, but I was like by far the youngest. And then the highest was I think around like 45. So oh, man. This is, yeah, this is a career where people will come around to it at so many different points in life. And that's why therapists, I find them very interesting because everyone's why for what they do is so different. So mm -hmm. you do need a college education. You do need a graduate school education. And then if you think you're done at grad school, you are not. <laughs> uh, there's a thing called practicum, which I did not. I needed a definition for that word. I said, someone tell me what the heck that means. Um, yeah. Practicum is basically a uh, like it's a, a job you get when you're like about halfway through grad school, you work for free. It's like an internship basically. Oh, wow. And then you start working towards the amount of hours you need to accumulate to become licensed. Mm -hmm. That amount of hours is 3000. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. It's a lot. And it's not like, Oh, just clock in clock out. Like if you did eight hours of work, you get eight hours that day. Uh, uh, no, no, it works. Like, you need, I forget the exact ones because this was years ago now, but it was like, you need like 400 hours of group therapy. So that means if you were at work for eight hours, but you only did two groups, you only got two hours that day. Yeah. So <laughs> it's even if, and 
Well, and I worked in two languages and I worked my butt off because I, I work in, in English and Spanish. Okay. Um, I haven't worked in Spanish recently. That's when I, I live part time in Mexico so that I can get back up to that because I really want to be able to work in both languages again. But okay. even with two languages, putting my head to the ground and just grinding it out, it still took me about two and a half years to get licensed. And there's a couple tests you take in between there to get for like the, the board of behavioral science. So you become, you go from being a trainee to an associate and then licensed. So mm -hmm. it is a long journey and it's not very, it's not a super accessible profession, mm -hmm. which I hope that that changes in time yeah. because when you are in that traineeship, you're not paid. And sometimes in order to get the supervision that you need, not only are you not paid, you also have to pay your supervisor to work with you. Interesting. <laughs> so it is not super accessible and not easy to do. I got very, very lucky because I was working in two languages and made sure that I really leaned into my professional relationships. I was offered a job before I even ended grad school. And so that was very helpful. Was it a little tough having a graduate degree and making $21 an hour? Yeah. Because oh, yeah. I was like, oh, because uh, you hear, <laughs> oh, you have a, you have a, a master's degree. You got to be making good money. That was, that was a hard <laughs> hit to go right there. That was tough. Um, oh, so it, it is a journey and those are all the things that's basically what it takes. There's more to it, but those mm. are the things that I wish I had known because it, it was a lot more than what I ever thought. No, I love it. Do you, how many people like fell off or like flunked out? You think like from like Ooh. your original like starting cohorts? Then mm -hmm. one, we had one person okay. not make it. Yeah, and they. It's so funny you ask that. I was so competitive <laughs> about this, and I had no control over it. When we got to to class the first day, um, our our professor told us he goes, "No cohort has ever had a cohort where everybody made it to graduation." And I was like, it's going to be us. And literally within the first two weeks, someone like had a major life change. So they had oh, to drop wow. the program. I was like, that shouldn't count. But if I yeah. mean, it counted. So still no cohort has done it, but Man. it's been some years. Maybe someone has by now, but yeah, only one person didn't make it. And since then, it's kind of like the process of getting licensed. I've noticed all my classmates have had like just different paces at which they mm. went, but that's just life, you know? Yeah. Definitely. Okay. I, kn I know you were mentioning that like, it's, it's not like super accessible, right? C like currently, or when you did it, do you think in the future, like they may like dampen the requirements, like maybe not requiring graduate degree or like maybe like going full, like licensure, not even a bachelor's or. <laughs> no, thousand percent not. No, I think, okay. I think they're likely to make it more accessible in other ways. Like things mm -hmm. that, cause I know that we, I would imagine like the board of behavioral science wants to make sure that people are very well trained. They've received all the education necessary. Cause if you think about it, like as a therapist, I am working with people who are self-harming. They're considering ending their life. Like you want to make sure that therapists are trained and know how to handle these things. And so it's very important to have the education where I see the possibility for more accessibility is, Hey, these kids, oh my gosh. Hey, people for the work that they do. Like you can probably hear the aggravation in my voice. Like it, <laughs> it baffles me. Like, what do you mean you expect free labor? Yeah. What, like you're supposed to pay for graduate school, pay to receive your supervision and have zero income that yeah. make that make sense. It just doesn't. And, and like, so do most, do most of like the um, attendees, like, like, do they have like a full-time job you think? Or like, 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 do they have like savings that they like, kind of like, just like, yeah, I saw it go one of a few ways. Me, I got, uh, I was very fortunate that where I went to grad school, my parents lived very close to that school. Yeah. So my parents were like, you can live at home and just get through school really quick. And I was like, I'll do it. Let's go for it. I, <laughs> yeah. I, I want to save the money. So let's go Definitely. for it. Some people uh, will take longer to get through school because they have a two, there was a two, two and a half and three year track where I went, I just did the two year lift with my parents got out of there as fast as possible. People who mm -hmm. really need to work and don't have that option, they will take, uh, they'll have their job and then just take a little bit longer to mm -hmm. finish school. 
Okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. Give give us like your day to day, like your average. I mean, I, I I'm sure your days like fluctuate, like what you do, but I guess like your av your most common average day, I guess. Yeah, you're hitting me at an interesting point in my career. I recently went into private practice and only work for myself now. Okay, nice. Um, I got to say, I am loving the private practice world. Uh, my day, like even today, for example, I worked with a couple of clients. We, I'm a dialectical behavioral therapist and a radically open dialectical behavioral therapist. Like those are the orientations I use with my clients. So I worked with both of them. I enjoyed my day very much and nice. I got to, and I only, I'm like just working virtually. So then I get to like spend time with my dogs, enjoy being in Mexico. And then I get to do fun stuff like this. I also look into, I do some, some speaking engagements. And then I also will guest lecture in different college classes because I really think it's important to normalize mental health treatment and make sure people know that there there's access, there's options and where they can find access to mental health services. Definitely. I love it. I love it. Give us, I know you said you're like, you're doing your, your own private practice now, but what, what were like the pros and the cons of like being like, I guess, employed by like a, I guess, a, like a medical health company, whoever like, whoever yeah. employed you. Uh, goodness. Yeah. It really, so I've done a couple, I've worked in a couple of different settings, so I can kind of break it down quickly based on the different settings I've worked in. So the first setting I did was a nonprofit. It was centered around ending child abuse. So it was a lot of court mandated individuals regarding domestic violence allegations, child abuse, child neglect, and child neglect allegations. So um, I would say like the, the pros of being there was I got lucky with some amazing supervisors. Like these are people that I talk to, to this day, they have been supportive of me in my career and I've gained so many nuggets of wisdom from them. And I was just put in this situation where my grad program paired me up with the perfect match for me. And, uh, you also get lots of opportunity for growth. Like they really wow. pushed me to work in both English and Spanish. Cause I was definitely shying away from working in Spanish just cause I was yeah. like, it's not my first language. And like most people who work here, it's their first language. I don't want anyone to think that I'm not giving them adequate care. And my supervisors were very nice about like, well, we'll practice a little bit and then you need to just go do it. Like you got to mm -hmm. rip the bandaid off. So I appreciated that opportunity on the flip side. The con is like, you're, you're never really going to make a, a livable wage at least mm -hmm. i haven't heard of that when you're working like on the the front grounds of a uh, nonprofit okay. uh within therapy at least um and you can feel like you're you're like spread a little thin cuz there is so many different things that you're doing and personally i don't enjoy working with grants like writing grants or having to make sure that i'm working within the bounds of a mm. grant and oftentimes within nonprofits, the money that we're receiving is from grants that have certain stipulations okay. and it's just kind of a lot to balance in your mind when you're like yeah. treating someone. So that would be, that's a con for me. Some people, they don't mind and it doesn't bug them, but yeah. so that's nonprofit. And then from nonprofit, I went to for profit. Ugh, the biggest thing, biggest pro about nonprofit real quick. They are for the people. Like okay. you, if you want to make sure that you're truly at least the nonprofit I was at, I know there's always going to be those outliers of like yeah. crazy organizations, <laughs> but yeah. the one I was at is called Richstone Family Center. And like, they, they truly, truly cared. So nice. it felt so soul filling and like within, it, it was within my purpose and meaning on this earth. So I was like, yeah. oh, that was so amazing. And then you go into for profit and you're kind of slapped across the face with like, <laughs> oh, Money matters. <laughs> Got yeah. it. Okay. Uh, so I worked in inpatient substance abuse treatment. The pro was I did make a little bit more money. I did mm. appreciate that. Made living a little easier. Um, I appreciated gaining knowledge about substance abuse issues. I didn't learn much about that in grad school. So I learned a lot on that front. Ugh, the cons, it's an insurance money making machine. Mm -hmm. Like it really run like where I was at because it was an insurance funded place where it was, if you have insurance, you can come here. It just felt like how many clients can we stuff you full with so that we can get as much money as possible. And 
is kind of like, and also in Southern California, we're a hub for kind of shady backdoor stuff when it comes to substance abuse treatment centers. And yeah. I didn't know that. I imagine me, I'm coming from my nonprofit world thinking all people want to do is help people. <laughs> And then I get sat into this with a supervisor who was completely unsupportive. And I learned so much from her in a different way. Like I learned so much about how to be assertive, how to stand sure in my purpose, what's important yeah. to me and where my limits lie and where I'm not willing to budge. Yeah. So I am grateful for that. I just also was a very tough pill to swallow how far different companies are willing to go with making money at the expense of someone's mental health. And I find that disgusting. Yeah. So that was, and not, and there are good treatment centers out there. Like we do need reco recovery does happen and it it's a beautiful thing when it happens. Mm -hmm. It's just, you got to make sure you're at a reputable place. And then most recently I was at a DBT center where that's where I learned to be a standard DBT therapist, which was just a very specific form of skill-based treatment where people learn mindfulness, distress tolerance, interpersonal effectiveness, and emotion regulation. Mm -hmm. And um, here's where it's also a for-profit company, but oh my gosh, their, their mission. When I interviewed, I was like, I need to know that you guys are aligned with like helping <laughs> people because I cannot work in another place where you do not prioritize yeah. the people. And yeah. the best thing about it was like, I really found my community of people where they want to help people. We consult with each other on a weekly basis. And I just felt overall supported and I've made like lifelong friends with those clinicians and even, even our bosses, like just absolutely amazing people. And the only con that I can really think of, because there's not many, and it's really tough, even as a therapist, because there's a lot of stigma for therapists of like, you shouldn't, because you don't become a therapist for the money. And at the yeah. same time, we have to make enough money to live. And like, I, I don't want to just live. I want to be able to enjoy some nice things in life. I don't need a Ferrari, but like, yeah. I want to get my nails done every three weeks. Yeah. And I would like to go out to dinner twice yeah. a month. I would really like that. And I don't find that to be very extravagant. So yeah. it really came down to, I want to hit my own financial goals. So if I'm going to do this and be able to work with the population I want to work with, because in working with another company in general, while they, they may say like, oh, you can work with whatever population you want, there's going to be an understanding of what that company's known for that it's really hard to carve your own way. So yeah. I knew I needed to start doing my own thing if I was going to help the exact population that I want to help and reach different financial goals that I have for myself. So I just feel very aligned at this time with being able to help the population that I got into this for, for to start with. And it's just a, a really, really empowering place to be. Like I feel constantly inspired. So it's pretty cool. It makes sense. And I love it. I think I think you're I think you're the fifty, my fifty third guest and you definitely like the most well, let me not say the most, but you're definitely like top two of like most passionate about your job, which is a good which is a great thing. Like you actually might be the most. I just wanna Thank I you. My I friends say, are you know as an athlete, I do not do first loser. Second <laughs> first loser. No, it, you honestly, you probably, you probably like, or or maybe you're like, you're the most like you like you show it the most, like you like you show the most passion. Okay, that, that's gonna be the first half of the interview. We'll go to the not so speed round, which is exactly what it is. We're gonna ask you some questions and see what you can think of for them. Uh, first question is, what are four words that describe a therapist? Compassionate, kind, burnt out. Mm. Is there two words or one? That, that'd, be, that'd be one. I mean, it's two, but it kind of okay. one. one. Okay. Yeah. And then integrity. Can you elaborate on integrity for us? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that um, it's just being uh, like doing, acting how you'll act within your values, even when nobody's watching. Mm. Like, I think therapists are really, we're, we're really good at being, of course, not all of us, there's going to be outliers, but we, yeah. we do take our ethical codes pretty seriously. At least all the therapists I've sent, like put myself around and, yeah. and talk to. I was watching this, uh, there's like a YouTube or I guess a Facebook, like real or short. And it was like about like marriage therapists and like, this dude was like, like 
he was going in like acting like he was cheating on his wife and he was like like he was a four different ones and like all of them like they stayed like to like the ethical code like like to the uh things it was interesting i thought i thought they all were gonna break it like they were going like they were going to say like, hey but they they all say to the code so it's definitely interesting mm -hmm. what's a profession that you think is like is most like therapy oh, that's obviously not therapy huh. Well, there's an easy answer to that. Like what profession would be closest to being a therapist, right? Yeah. Life coaches would definitely claim that one. Okay. Can you elaborate on, I see a lot of life coaches. Can you elaborate on why, I guess, why it's a good comparison? I don't even like saying, I just think it's a comparison. Like, I don't know that it's a good one. Like I wouldn't give it that mm. judgment word. I would just say okay. like, that's probably the closest comparison. Um, like it's interesting. And the only reason I'm saying this is because their ethical code is very close to, or like their privilege as a therapist, it's like the same privilege they get is like priests and pastors. They also mm. have confidentiality. So okay. them too, but with life coaches, it's because like, I know since I'm a light, I'm a licensed therapist, right? My license yeah. is tied to the state of California. I cannot act as a licensed therapist to anyone outside the state of California. And in order for me to reach more people, I do work as a mindset coach or a life mm -hmm. coach or just a coach so that I can reach more people and support yeah. more people. I just legally cannot call myself a licensed therapist if I'm like working with you over in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. I legally can't do that. So okay. that that's sense. why. I'm, and there's a couple of different things that have been going on. Like there's there's different coaching programs that like coach therapists to be coaches to kind of get us comfortable with the idea of like, we don't need to be bound by our state or the state you live in doesn't need to dictate how many people you can help, mm, which I appreciate. But that's why I'd say that's like the closest comparison. Okay. That makes sense. I, Cause I see a lot of life coaches, but I never knew what it meant. So like, so like most of them, most of them are kind of like therapists that are like operating like in different areas. If, if they, there are a lot of therapists that are coaches. And I would just say when it comes to coaching, you have to be very, very careful. Coaches don't even need, they, they could have gone to second grade and that's it. Like there's no level of education needed. Yeah. I like anyone could wake up tomorrow and say, I am a coach and I help CEOs reach the next level. Anyone can, anyone can say that. Yeah. Whereas not everyone can wake up and say, I'm a licensed therapist and I help couples feel more connected. Like they, definitely. you can't do that legally. Yeah. You can't, that's fraudulent and you'll get in a lot of trouble. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, right. <laughs> what, what does the world look like without a licensed therapist? Oh my gosh. Especially post COVID. Oh, this is going to sound dark. I feel like suicidality would be way up. Oh man. Yeah. That's kind of dark. <laughs> but no, but right, it not intense. I'm just yeah. thinking about the stats and it was like, I know even, and the, even the research, was saying while COVID was going on, it was anticipating that mental health was going to be even more needed after the pandemic, more so than during it. And all of that research is turning out to be true. Like people mm. are, are really needing support because it's difficult to go from being isolated, going back into a community oriented type of space. It's just yeah. really difficult. You're right. You're right. I, I'm, I work remote, so I'm definitely isolated. And I went to a, a work a work trip this week and it was just so weird because like I've been working for this company for like eight months and I haven't seen anybody for a little like eight months and I went in person, it was like 3,000 people. And it's like, what am I doing here? Like, it was a weird oh, Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. it was definitely weird. Um, are, are licensed, uh, therapists overpaid or underpaid? It depends. Well, it depends. That's literally <laughs> every therapist's favorite answer, by the way. <laughs> uh, so it's kind of like, like what I just told you, like if you, it kind of, it depends on like, are you in a nonprofit world? Are you doing private practice? Most therapists are going to tell you under, mm. and I am a firm believer that so therapy is mostly a female driven profession. Mm. Even though all of the founding fathers of therapy are all like male oriented theories, which blows my mind. I'm like, how's this profession mostly women? And then all of the things we learn about are from men. Yeah. It doesn't make sense. But um, <laughs> the, the therapy I do was created by a woman, Marshall. Nice, Martin, yeah. so represent, she, we're represented. But um, <laughs> yeah, I would say overall, we're underpaid. It's a female driven profession. And in general therapy, and this is just like my own take on it, um, because I haven't really heard this anywhere else, but my thoughts on it is that therapists tend to be introverts. I'm extremely extroverted. I'm like an outlier when it comes to therapists. Therapists are usually not jumping at the opportunity to come on podcasts and talk about their mm -hmm. profession, what they like, what they dislike, what like 
it's not something we tend to do. So we also don't like marketing ourselves. So mm-hmm. it's very difficult for us to get into private practice and start assigning a dollar amount to our service because mm-hmm. of the stigma of like, well, you're a therapist. You should just want to help people and not make money. It's like, nice. oh, but we have to, or else how are we going to survive in this capitalistic society? Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. that. Yeah. I didn't think... I didn't, I didn't, I guess, I guess, because I've never been in therapy, which I probably do need to go to some, some, some sort of therapy. Oh my God, you can talk after. I'll help you learn how to get connected. Don't you worry. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. But yeah, that it, may, it makes sense. But like you, you saying that most ther- therapists are introverted, like it, it may, it makes sense. Not like, like when I think of the concept of therapy, it makes, it makes sense. I think that like they ask, or you guys ask really good questions and then people just have to answer honestly <laughs> for the most part. <laughs> What's, yeah. um, Oh, one person, book, or event that changed uh, your life for the positive? Person, book, or event. Oh, I would say an event. An event would probably be meeting my fiance. Okay. I think that when when I met him, he's like he's in the Coast Guard and also does like contract work within private security, and he's a, a very driven person. And he just got, he's the one who like got me thinking about working for myself. Cause he was the one who told me like, Hey, we could, he knows he's also from Mexico. So his first language was Spanish. Okay. He knows how passionate I am about the language of Spanish. And he's really been able to take everything that I care about in life and create a life that is conducive to all of that because our values are so aligned and so, so similar that um he made it so that like we can live part-time in mexico so that i can gain more fluency and then also we've always just really prioritized traveling like he's basically the reason i get to lead the life that i want to live with me because it's also very important to me that i contribute to our family like i could never not work and he was the one who like pushed me to work for myself have my own company And has really encouraged me to be like, you can do this. Yes, it will be scary. And I know that you got this. So I would say literally meeting him is the reason that like I'm doing it. What's his name? His name's Gabriel. Shout out Gabriel. I'm not lying. You're the, I guess, like I said earlier, you're the 53rd guest I had. And you're the first one that said like their spouse or partner, like literally like the first, I always wait, I always wait for it. And like, I, no one has ever said it. So shout out Gabriel. I, I love that. I love that. And, um, I was going to ask you a question earlier about, uh, Spanish, um, how, like, it's, it's kind of unrelated to the, to, to the therapy therapist side of it, yeah. but how has it been, been like being like bilingual and learning the language? I, I'm actually learning the language too. I have another business and like. Cool. My uh, workers or uh, team team members are like primarily like their Spanish descent, so like I'm trying to learn it myself. So mm-hmm. how how is like how's your experience been like mastering or, or like attempting to master it? I guess. Oh, it has been like actual like a literal headache. Like it's a lot of brain work. <laughs> like it's a lot of it's because uh, we just we recently went to go visit his family, and he comes from a town where when I go there, I him and I are the only people that know English. Like it's oh, literally wow. like girl, you better figure it out because (laughs) that's your only choice. And I actually appreciate that because it does force me into like, I have to get with it. I can't just switch Mm. back. Um, But like a literal like headache because it's so much work. And then it's also funny because we were actually just, um, when we were eating lunch today, he told me we were talking about something and there's these funny things that will like coincidences between English and Spanish. We were talking Mm -hmm. about Denny's and he was like, what was what was that one meal called like the big slam i was like the grand slam and i told him i was like you said big because grande means big in spanish Mm -hmm. he was like exactly so there's like these little funny like play on words that happen so it's cool i like that okay yeah all right (laughs) shout out gabriel again um last question um let's say young lady named carrie 18 years old she's watching this interview she gets inspired by you she wants to become a licensed therapist. What are the steps that you give her or just general advice that you give her to get to where you're at? Oh my gosh. She could literally reach out to me on any of my social medias and I would be happy to do like a 20 minute zoom call just to answer any questions. And then I would say, knowing what I set up top, like if you want to become a licensed therapist, it's knowing that it's going to take more than probably what you thought of. And I would say, 
start looking into grad programs sooner rather than later, just to get an idea of what those programs focus on. Like I knew I wanted something that was focused on grief. So I found a trauma and grief program. So I would say just start with looking into different programs and what they offer, what their program is geared towards. Perfect. I love it. Thank you, Erica. Give a shout out to like your business and then, um, you can say your socials too, but I'll, I'll put them in a the thumbnail because I'll actually okay. awesome. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm Erica Curry, licensed marriage and family therapist. The My business is called Skilled Mind. You can find me on Psychology Today. If you just put in Erica Curry, I'll pop up. Uh, also, you can just find me on TikTok and Instagram at Erica Curry LMFT. And I also have a podcast called Ben Don't Break, Living Flexibly, where I talk about all things DBT and RODBT when it comes to athletics, and my co-host specializes in eating disorders, So, uh, and that's available on Spotify. So that's me. Nice. And I did, I don't remember, I don't remember when I reached out to you, but I did check out an episode of you guys. It was a <laughs> while back. Yeah. I think you sent it to me, or maybe I saw you post it in the Facebook chat. Uh -huh. uh, or the Facebook group. And I, I definitely took the episode out. Okay, nice. Awesome. Well, thank you again, Erica. Everyone that's still tuned in, please like, comment, and subscribe. And y'all have a nice day.